I'm really interested. How many of you watching online right now want to make religion mad? How many of you are just sick and tired of the oppressive nature of the spirit of religion that has bound the churches in your community, that has bound the churches in this nation and around the world? Let me know in the comments because I believe it's time to expose the enemy of revival and to raise up some radical praise-filled warriors, which is why I'm so excited to have with us two women who are baptized in the spirit of revival and they're bringing a fresh revelation to what it means to walk in revival to the body of Christ today. Kim Owens, along with her husband Paul, pastor, Fresh Start Church in Arizona, along with her daughter, Jessica Schluter, who has been the youth leader as well as the worship leader there at the ministry, and they have been experiencing a legitimate revival since 2015. How did they get that revival in their church? How have they been able to sustain it for nearly eight years? Tonight, we're taking the cover off. You're going to learn how to bring it to your house, your family, your church, and your city. So without any further ado, let's dive into the interview with pastors Kim and Jessica. Pastors Kim and Jessica, thank you so much for being with us on Encounter today. Thank you for having us, thank Alan. It's an us. honor to be here. Yes. Well, it's only been like two years in the making because we've been trying to get you on this program for two years. <laughs> but you've been, you've been in sustained revival now since 2015. I've actually gone back into your YouTube channel and looked okay. at your services prior wow. to 2015. <laughs> and it's no joke. There is a there is a legit transformation that mm -hmm. takes place. How did you guys break into this revival? Wow, and that is so awesome. First of all, that you did that, <laughs> yeah. that you went back pre uh, our re revival explosion. Yeah. I wanted to see what made it happen. I wanted to see, okay, how no, did no. we lead into this? Yeah, no, that's, that's very, very smart, very smart. Um, but, you know, we took a turn, Alan, in 2012 and 2013, and it basically it was through de uh, desperation, um, desperation to see God move in our personal lives, my husband and I as uh, lead pastors here, but also to see him uh, really just move in our church. We were very, very um, weary of, of just a church protocol as it had become, uh, even in the Pentecostal uh, circles and the spirit field circles, just, mm. you know, trying to get people in, trying to grow a church instead of birthing a move of God. And um, that's how I know how to say it now. I didn't know how to say it uh, in those days, but really it was all about just trying to grow a church instead of instead of birthing a move of God. And so the Lord just began to make us desperate and hungry. And there's a there's a whole story behind that that I write about in Doorkeepers of Revival, but it just brought us to a place where we were desperate. And we, we just said, God, if we just got to have you. We've got to have more of you. We've got to have you move. We've got to have you break in. We've got to have your Holy Ghost. We've got to have people getting saved. We've got to have people getting filled with the Holy Ghost. We've got to have a tangible uh, 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 presence that we feel and we just we wanted revival and you know that revival is the word and I know there's a lot of definitions but what we have said and continue to say revival is his manifested presence is because when his manifested presence comes everything changes right. and so when he breaks right. in uh, with that manifested presence then it literally uh, you know we just follow him and we follow what he needs to do and so we begin to we begin to take our turn into that Alan into 20 the latter part of 2012 definitely all of 2013 and 2014 we begin to highlight prayer we begin to become a house of prayer mm -hmm. and, and and not just have prayer meetings. Uh, that was our sole focus in the beginning, especially in 2013 and 2014. 2013 was a year of just really pursuing God in intimacy. 2014 really became focusing on making prayer priority in our personal lives as leaders, but also transferring that and teaching our people in their secret places and things like that as a byproduct of both of those because prayer bursts hunger and hunger feeds prayer. I mean, they mm -hmm. just ebb and flow together. And then the desperation, you throw the desperation into it. And then finally, if you have those, that recipe, I guess I should say, you're going to have revival breakout. And that's what happened in August of 2015. But I want Jessica to share, because um, honestly, we can't tell the story without, because it's a longer story than what I'm sharing now, but without telling what God was doing in the youth and the young adults. Because honestly, Alan, prophetic word came to us in, I think it was around 2009, and a credit where credit is due, it was Cindy Jacobs, mm -hmm. and she prophesied that the a move of God was going to come to our church and was going to be start and begin through the youth and the children. The Lord 
would say, go back to the first thing I showed you. For that was the pattern I gave on the mountain, says the Lord. And the Lord would say, you have been in midst of a shaking. But God would say, I pruned. But the pruning is over. And the Lord would say, there is now going to be growth, says God. God says, it's going to be like you cannot believe. The Lord says, the wilderness is getting ready to bloom like a rose, says God. And the Lord would say to you, there's going to be rivers in the desert places. Streams in the desert are coming from above, says the Lord. And the Lord says, especially upon the youth and the children, I am coming to pour out my spirit, says God. And the Lord would say to you, even upon your own family, even upon your own seed, I am getting ready to pour out my spirit in a measure greater than you can imagine. And in, whoa. Oh, my. Oh, my. God says to you, get out of the boat. Launch out into the deep. I have called you to the deep things. I have not called you to swim in the shallow end. I have called you to get into the river and flow in the river. And the Lord would say there has been persecution because you have been in the river. And there have been those that didn't understand you being in the river. But God would say the river is going to flow through your church. It is coming with a wave of miracles. It is coming with a wave of signs and wonders greater than you can imagine and greater than you thank you lord and so i want jessica just to share what god was doing in the in the youth and the young adults in simultaneously that season. simultaneously as you guys are developing this in 2012 yeah. 2013 there's something's happening in the youth absolutely yeah. during that season is when my husband and i took over as youth and young adult pastors during that same season. Um, and so we had been with them for years, leading worship for them for years, probably about 10 years at that point. And then we shifted mm. into that role as their pastors. Um, and the Lord spoke to me and told me that this is going to be a generation of worshipers and intercessors. Mm. And so I told my husband, I said, this is what the Lord said. So we need to be obedient and do everything we know how to do. And we didn't know much <laughs> in that season, everything we knew how to do to train these teenagers and young adults to be worshipers and intercessors. We didn't know that that was going to be the foundation to uphold the spirit of revival is the spirit of intercession and the spirit of praise and worship. Uh, two things that uphold the spirit of revival. So we cultivated that. And what that began to do is cultivate an atmosphere of hunger and desperation for a move of God in our youth and our young adults. And what happened in 2015, if we want to get to that point, yeah, yeah, yeah. is we ha were having a youth and young adult conference. Um, uh, the entire church had been in their time of pursuit up to this point. And, you know, at our youth and young adult conference, our entire church, we don't have it any longer, but our entire church came to that and attended that. So all ages were in the room and it just came essentially, for lack of better words, to a head um, where there was a breaking out yeah. of the spirit of God and everything that we had been contending for and cultivating um, just decided to manifest in the atmosphere. And the Lord was touching people all over the room. It was an old building. We don't have it anymore. Um, it was our youth building. It was old. Most youth buildings are. Yeah. And it was it was hot. It was the middle of August. Um, the air stopped working. There's probably about 500 people in the building didn't fit in the sanctuary. Half of them were sitting in the foyer and the Lord just broke out in such a tangible, powerful way. And we knew at that point that this is it. We're mm. crossing the threshold and stepping into revival. So what do you do yes. at that point then? Now, now that, now that, okay, this is it. This is what we've been contending for. You've got to be like, okay, what do we do? What do we do? Do we keep the meeting going? Uh, do, and how do we not wear everyone out in the process? Of, you know, so what's the next step then? And we did ask all those questions. <laughs> we did ask all those questions and, and the Lord helped us. And then, and uh, doorkeepers, I call it our, the breadcrumbs of the Holy Spirit. And honestly, Alan, we were following literally just little uh, spiritual breadcrumbs of the Holy Spirit uh, the entire way after that. And as a pastor, you know, you feel, I mean, we're, we're, our church wasn't like like traditional, traditional, but at the same time, we, we had a lot of the traditional model mm -hmm. of structures. everything, structures and things like yeah. that. And so in that season, we were, very um, 
not really reluctant, but we were very cautious in changing things. But yet we knew that the wine skin had to uh, be changed. The wine skin had to change and the wine skin had to grow in order to hold uh, the, 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 you know, the new wine of the spirit that, that had been poured out in that initial uh, weekend there with the youth and young adult conference. And, um, uh, you know, we just began to ask, Lord, what do we do from here? And, you know, there's a, a lot of details, but basically we just said, Lord, you know, show us what to do. And at that moment, at that season, we had a voice in our life that that we were telling what was happening in that season of our church. And he said something very wise to us. And it was he said, you know, you build your structure around the move of God. And if there's one thing that I guess, you know, especially if pastors that are watching and listening um, and ministry leaders, you know, the move of God is everything. And I mean, we speak spent two, definitely two full years turning into that. And that was a lot of, 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 um, of uh, it was conception. It was, it was uh, uh, nurturing the baby, if you will, and then the birthing of it. And then, so when that comes, you want to make sure you're raising that baby uh, right. And so we just asked the Lord what to do. And he said, you know, one of the, one of the significant things was build the, build the, the uh, structure of your church around the move of God. And so we just began to do that. And we began to shift and move things um, you know, uh, uh, so that the move of God would take precedence and that, but that, but also we could still, uh, have a local church, a healthy growing local church that meets the needs of families. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing that we did was we said, you know, we're going to keep this going. And we went to every Sunday night. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, that was, that was what impeded on the youth time. Is that correct? Right. Because before this in our pursuit, we had originally, like normal, I guess you could say, churches. We did our Wednesday night mm -hmm. Bible study thing. That's when we had youth group every mm -hmm. Wednesday night. Um, there were Bible study classes for the adults, you know, typical, I guess, structure, if mm -hmm. you will. And we shifted that. This is before the breakout. We shifted that to moving our prayer meeting to every Wednesday night mm -hmm. um, to make a priority on prayer. Yeah. Okay. So when we did that, we moved our youth and young adult service to Friday nights. No, no, no. Sunday nights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was mm -hmm. that. We moved it to a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> we moved it to Sunday nights. Um, and and then revival broke out on Sunday night. Yeah. And then we decided to have a revival service for all ages every Sunday night. Yeah. So for an entire year, we shared our youth and young adult service with the entire congregation in order to feed the spirit of revival. Yeah. And it didn't lack in any way, shape or form in our ministry mm -hmm. or in our students mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. If anything, it built a solid foundation, mm -hmm. I believe, for them. And kind of to recap, Alan, just so people that are watching kind of know, because we're sharing a lot. But for Wednesday nights, for to change the wine skin, we turned it for our gap services that we call it, yep. our worship and intercession. We changed that in 2014 for worship and intercession only. So that took away the children's ministry and the youth ministry that was happening on that night. And then when we decided, when revival broke out, we decided to take it to Sunday night. Then, you know, we were doing it every Sunday night for one solid year. And then we went to the weekend model like we are doing now. Um, all of those changes, as Jessica just said, it was initially, it was very, you know, we were very cautious about it. But every move that we made, that was instructed by the Holy Spirit, not change just for the sake of change. But every move that we made, the Lord was honoring that because we were building the structure around the move of God. Right. And uh, we really haven't suffered uh, uh, as a local church uh, in, any, in any way, shape, or form on any of those ministries that had to be moved around. But it's all to accommodate the move of God so that it could be sustained. Wow. be sustained in our midst. Well, I can testify to that having been there and in Doorkeepers of Revival in the book, you walk through the history of this in very, yeah. very yeah. much detail. So we're going to provide a link for that in the description. And then Jessica, uh, Praise Filled Warriors is your newest book that you have out where you walk through the revelation we're about to dig into here in a moment. And then mm -hmm. Pastor Kim, Just to Make Religion Mad. This, I, you know, I, Doorkeepers of Revival walks you through the history, but just to make yeah. religion mad, I think gives you the practicalities of, of everything yeah. you need to do. So let's talk practically for a second. When you go, when you change the structure to follow the cloud, I'm sure immediately there's some holy cows that have to die structurally yeah. in the old wineskin. What are some yeah. of the things that you had to run against first, some things you had to restructure in order to say, we can't do it this way anymore. Now we have to do it this way. Well, I think one big thing, and you can mention if you think, feel anything else, but I think one thing that is very familiar to uh, local churches specifically is small groups. 
Um, small mm-hmm. groups, you know, uh, can, they, it is, they're very needed and we believe in them and we have them. Uh, but we, um, we decided, you know, we're going to, we're going to offer this for our people and we're going to, we're going to scale it back to once a month instead of every week or, uh, uh, or every other week or whatever the structures that we had at that time. And one of the main reasons, uh, Alan, is that is to free our people up to be able to pursue, uh, the Lord, but also be able to, per, to participate in all that revival demands because revival structure will demand. It's a physical demand. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, a spiritual demand, definitely. And then a logistical thing as mm-hmm. well, if you're going to sustain it. And so I think that's probably the first thing that comes to mind mm-hmm. is, and, uh, you know, we really didn't get really any kind of pushback or anything like that next very much so from us in our in our realm but i think that was probably one significant thing that we that we reworked uh there um obviously the prayer meeting was already engaged the wednesday night we were already going strong in that so we wanted people to make that a priority and we still do we wanted people because if you're going to burst revival and if you're going to sustain revival you have to have a strong strong culture of prayer and it can't just be a prayer meeting off to the side and a prayer meeting in the back that Mm -hmm. mostly the ladies and the older ladies come to you know uh, it's got to be a the heartbeat it's got to be made priority. You got to clear your calendar so that uh, not you know so that your your calendar submits to prayer. And that was first and foremost um, when we knew that we were going to be sustaining. You know, the Lord was dealing with us that this is not just a visitation for a moment. This needs to be turned into stewarding a habitation, and that is the whole concept of the mantle and the assignment that God had given us. But I think those are some of the some of the first things that we ran up against, you know, that this is going to have to switch. This is going to have to look a little different than we've always um, had it look. But honestly, the grace of God was on it. Can you think of anything else other than that? But the grace of God was was on everything that we did. Well, let me ask this very quickly as you're, as you're thinking about that, Jessica. When I walked into your church, one of the things that was startling is I've been in places where the anointing is coming from the platform, maybe from the front row. But when you walk into your church, it seems as though everyone knows why they're there. And the same mm-hmm. glory and anointing is coming from the back row mm-hmm. as it is from the front row. And then you mm-hmm. start off with prayer and you're pulling people up on the stage and they're praying heaven down. If I can ask this, how do you, how do you train your people for prayer? The people that get up on stage, do you just kind of grab anyone just randomly and pull them up on stage? Or is there a process to develop mm-hmm. that within discipling that within your people? Well, there is a process to answer that question first for people to to pray and to be on stage praying. There's a process of that. There's, uh, um, um, uh, you know, expectations that they have to meet before they're allowed to participate in that level of leading in prayer and stuff. But I think to answer it, um, uh, the, uh, the, the question about getting that resonation in the atmosphere mm-hmm. is honestly, Alan, in the very beginning, and this is something that we fight hard to keep, and I really hit it. In, in just to make religion mad mm-hmm. is we started with a raw cry and we fight to keep the raw cry mm-hmm. and I do lay that out very uh, clearly mm-hmm. in just to make religion mad religion is rehearsed religion is is um, uh, uh, rehearsed it is more performance it is it is filtered it is something that I feel comfortable with but revival is raw it is unedited it is it is unfiltered it is unrehearsed so basically the picture is this is that when revival hits it touches something on the inside of us that releases a raw cry for our God and a raw cry for for intimacy with Jesus and when you get that Hmm. you have to fight to keep that if you're going to sustain it and this alan is where um possibly revivals of old may have in history or even outpourings that people have had Mm -hmm. have um, stopped short of where they could have kept going if they would just pay the price to cult keep cultivating continue cultivating that rawness on the inside uh that unfiltered a desperation for God. So to answer your question, 
we to keep the resonation of what you felt and you heard in the atmosphere we are constantly feeding that raw cry that rawness that resonation i call it in my book the resonation of the raw um david had it david you read through the psalms david had a resonation of the raw uh it is that unfiltered and honestly when jessica was talking about the 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 youth and the young adults in those early days they would have desperate nights right Mm -hmm. desperate nights and they would just get together and they would just cry out to God. And we fight, Alan, to keep that cry. And, you know, here's the thing um, is that even even a cry, a cry can become religious if we do not continually cultivate the raw hunger for right. God on the right. inside of us. Right. And people might look at Fresh Start now, seven full years later, working on eight years of this, and think, well, they've got this down, they've got this down. Here's the reality of it. The moment that we think we've got this down, right. we have just left revival and we've entered right. religion. Wow. And I think if there's one message that your audience can get, yeah. please understand that every single day that we come in here at Fresh Start, and she can tell you as a praise and worship leader, I can tell you is leading the intercessors and our, our team leaders as well. I mean, it is a constant cultivation of that desperation. It's like and, going and up a down easy. escalator. It's like going up a down yeah. escalator. If you stop, you're going to, you're going to move backward, which, which, and, and, and you talk about in your book, how you can't copy a raw cry and the devil is after that raw cry. But Jessica, right. in your book, Praisefield Warrior, Establishing the Mantle of Judah, this is, this is one of the things that distinguishes what's happening there at your ministry. It is the atmosphere of praise, the revelation, not just on the platform, but within the congregation of praise. How, how did this break out? Because the last two decades, as, as the charismatic movement, the spirit-filled movement, it's, it's going deeper and deeper into what people would call worship. And yet you break out into this Davidic praise. Where did, where did this come from? Um, well, I got a revelation, I guess. <laughs> and it was my responsibility, I felt like, then to bring all, the, all who would listen um, up under that revelation as well. And um, I think that once we as a whole, especially obviously myself, just because of the position that I hold and then the team that around me, once we got that revelation of praise and were able to release it and everyone kind of came up um, underneath of it, there really has been a sovereign breakout of what I call the spirit of praise. Um, and the spirit of praise is a shout of thanksgiving and, and praise, and inhibited praise, um, undeniable praise um, that releases the kingship and the lordship of Jesus mm. Christ and causes every opposing spirit to bow to it Mm -hmm. Um, and if you engage in that every time you come together then your encounter with God is absolutely undeniable Mm -hmm. Um, he cannot hold back the heavens Mm -hmm. in an atmosphere that has been broken over broken open with the Mm -hmm. spirit of grace Um, and that's just kind of what we took and we just ran with it and we haven't stopped Um, and the Lord has honored that in a sense, because we are so diligent and passionate and zealful Mm -hmm. with our praise. He's honored that so that if we choose to stand in the position of the praiseful warrior every single time we enter his sanctuary, um, then he meets us with his presence and with his glory. And all it takes is one time for that transaction to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And once that transaction happens, you'll never be the same and you'll never stop until his presence comes yeah. every single time. Amen. What do you yeah. think people are missing then uh, when, when, because much of the church, this is absent. It's been gone for decades. The revelation yeah. of this type of Davidic praise has just evaporated. Right, yeah. Why do you think we've done that? What do you th- what's the appeal to gravitating toward what con- the contemporary church calls worship? Why do we yeah. run from and hide from this kind of praise? Well, one soothes the flesh and the other confronts mm. the flesh. The spirit of praise confronts the flesh, yeah. Yeah. right? Because yeah. it rids you of all dignity. Yeah. It rids you of yourself. Yeah. That's what the spirit of praise does. Mm-hmm. Um, so once you come up under that, it's almost as if you're not in control anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Lord is in control. Mm-hmm. And the church has become terrified of that. Judah has become terrified of that. Mm -hmm. Because the spirit of praise can be so confrontational, it doesn't market as well. It doesn't Mm -hmm. sell as well. Um, It doesn't look as good um, because it confronts demons and principalities. It does not soothe 
them, which is what the sound that you're referring to mm -hmm. does. Um, obviously, we know that there are many dimensions and measures to praise and worship. There are times when we soak in the presence of God. Yeah. Yeah. But oftentimes we don't do that until we've broken through with the spirit of praise yeah. and made sure that the king of glory has his glory. And so there's been this um, delusion of the enemy yeah. that has come over Judah over the last few years, especially that has taken her identity away from her. Yeah. And now she doesn't, in a sense, know who she is anymore. Yeah. So right. she just operates right. under the guise of performance and under the guise of, um, well, perversion in my opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's just manipulating the presence of God and prostituting the presence of God. Um, and so that's why I wrote this book. That's yeah. why I wrote this book, to expose, but at the same time, to hopefully give people a revelation of what we're really called to do. Mm -hmm. It's so much more than a CD or an album or a cool YouTube video or a download. And it's just become so much about that, that it's tainted it. And now there's mixture and everything's mm. diluted and it's fluid and it shouldn't be like that. It was never meant to be like that. Right. Psalm 149, the, the scripture that the entire book is based, uh, based on yeah. God's high and holy praises fill their mouths for their shouted praises are their weapons Amen. of war. These warring weapons bring vengeance on every opposing force, every resistant power to buy mm -hmm. kings with chains, rulers with iron shackles, praise filled warriors will enforce the judgment doom decreed against their enemies. This is the glorious yeah. honor. Come on. He gives all of his godly lovers hallelujah, praise the Lord. That's it. Amen. That's Good. it. And we've made it so many other things besides what it actually is supposed to be. I really feel like there's a sleeping giant on the inside of people. And, and when you said it, it just hit me that they, Judah doesn't even know, doesn't even know mm -hmm. that it's lost its identity. How do we get that back? How do we awaken that within people? How have you awakened it? You've mentioned earlier, Pastor Kim, about about cultivating that hunger. And I think in the book you talk about the, the hundredfold cry. How do, you, yeah. how do you cultivate that and unleash that? That, that? Well, it has to be literally, well, in a local church setting, it has to come from the leadership. I mean, you know, individual people can do it, you know, on their own. But I mean, for, for cultivating that cry, I mean, it just has to be that desperation that, God, I've got to have more. I've got to have more of you. Now, the, the, I just read this morning, Alan, in, in Genesis, uh, where it was uh, Jacob was blessing the sons, and Judah is one of them. And I just read in the commentary that I have in the study Bible that I have that, uh, 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 Judah is a vital part of revival. It's a vi vital part of revival. And so to your question, it is something that individually we have to stir up on the inside of us. And it is a sacrifice. And I believe, and I'll let Jessica speak to it, you know, with the revelation that God has given her. But I believe going from the context of religion, I believe that the spirit of religion has allowed the church, the body of Christ, to, to be lulled into this sleepiness of some of the of some of the soft songs, I call it, the soft songs, because they don't want, uh, they don't war want warriors to arise, they mm -hmm. don't want uh, the aggressiveness that it takes to push into the kingdom. You know, the, the uh, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent one take it by force. The word violence there is spiritual intensity, spiritual right. zeal, spiritual aggression. And so how that is stirred up is you have to have a revelation and understanding that we break into the kingdom through this type of worship and through this type of praise. And I believe the spirit of religion has attacked high praise, yeah. uh, kind of like Michael, and she writes about it in her book. I mm -hmm. preached about it before, kind of like Michael was attacking David mm -hmm. for looking mm -hmm. foolish because of how he was worshiping and praising the Lord uh, uninhibitedly. And I believe that spirit has come upon the modern church and people want to start at a place that they haven't paid the price to get to. Yet. Right. Right. Wow. Right. And that's, that's why there has to be a spirit of grace. Right. Because in his gates with thanksgiving and his mm. courts right. with grace. That's the, the protocol. Bible is very clear. The Bible is very clear. And you know, what I see in the modern worship movement is a severe lack of of revelation and really knowing the word of God. I think if that was our foundation, I don't think that 
um, so many would be steering to the right and That's to the right. left. That's right. Um, we spend too much time on secondhand revelations right. on YouTube preachers and YouTube videos mm -hmm. and, you know, this social media, that and this little thing and this little that. And we're not in the word of God and we're not grounded That's anymore, right. which is why we can blow to the to the east and to the west and, right. you know, whatever and go with this style and that style. And, and, and that's, I think that's kind of where we're at right now. And yeah. I, and I think I lay out in the book, the, the, the importance of being grounded in the word of God. I lay out in the book, the importance of holiness yeah. um, and righteousness mm -hmm. and um, all of those things that have to be our foundation as well. But what we see, I think right now in the church, going back to what you were saying before is really a blatant attack against pure Davidic worship. That's right. Mm. That's right. It is a blatant attack against pure Davidic worship and it is not coming from the outside. It is not coming from the world, but it is coming from within. Yeah. And it is coming from the spirit of religion. Amen. Man. It's coming from. And, you know, Alan, to the to the hundredfold cry that you mentioned a moment ago. Yes. Um, you know, when I write about that in the book, you know, the whole the whole concept or whole context there is what are we what are we bringing to God for Him to fill? Right. Are mm -hmm. we bringing uh, a thirtyfold? Are we bringing sixtyfold? Are we bringing a hundredfold? To me, it's not revival every time we come unless we bring the hundredfold. Right. And I'm going to tell you, and so that's that's the, the the concept of that chapter that I wrote in the book, the hundredfold cry. I want to be a hundredfold Christian. You know, I tell the story in that chapter about we've been given a, a a pew that was in the first great awakening, and I said that prayer to God early in our revival. God, come without measure, mm -hmm. and He said to me, Kim, you set the measure. You you set the measure of, of, of how I can manifest. And I just say that to the to the believers out there that are watching, to the pastors, to the worship leaders that are right. out there watching. Right. You set the measure. Are right. you going to put your hands on it and control it? Right. we got to right. have a hundredfold cry. And a hundredfold cry says, says it is limitless because God has realms of glory. He, has, he, he gives the spirit, the Bible says, without measure. And so if all of those things are true, which they are, they're in the word of God, if we have faith to believe that, right. then what we bring into our secret place, what we bring every time into our corporate right. uh, meetings is we have to bring a measuring cup, if you will, I'm just using that as an analogy, of a hundredfold. God, I want all that you can give me. And here's the kind of connect what I'm saying with what Jessica's revelation is, is, is Alan, high praise breaks that open. Right. It mm -hmm. breaks it open. And so that's why I said a moment ago, we want to start at a place, the modern worship movement um, and modern church wants to start at a place that they haven't paid the price to get to. And it's, 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 it's key important that we not lose our aggression in, in praise and in worship, the spiritual intensity, because the kingdom of heaven, all that God has to break open and manifest in miracle signs, wonders, glory, outpouring, visitation, it, it, it is big being resisted by a heavy spirit of religion right. and that is that is blocking it that is keeping it back how do we break into that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence there's an intensity in the spirit and an aggression that i believe a spirit of religion has stolen and one of the number one places that we see that is in the area of praise and worship i hope that made sense but oh, that yeah. is super super important right. I, i'm yeah. seeing it as you're sharing this the outer court inner court holy of holies thanksgiving praise yeah. worship everyone wants to jump to worship and I just as you were talking Jessica and and Pastor Kim I was I was kind of seeing the priest rolling up into the holy of holies without going through the there outer court go. the inner court that was yeah. certain death so we're we're yeah. inviting judgment upon ourselves without right. entering into that supernatural praise and so we're offering a counterfeit sound which has really been right. a revelation that you've had Jessica mm -hmm. can you can you talk to us about that yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the counterfeit, sound, you know, when you think of the word counterfeit, it, it is, and I don't, I don't think I put that in front of me here, but it is almost very close yeah. to the original, hmm. but there's just something slightly off about it. Yeah. And, you know, as I've you know, over the years just been pressing into the sound of heaven first, pursuing the sound of heaven first. And as I've been pursuing the sound of heaven, the Lord just began to bring to me um, the revelation of the counterfeit sound. Um, and the counterfeit sound um, in itself is something that the American church has unfortunately propagated and allowed to come in. And that is that sound that, like I said before, does not confront 
but suits. Yeah. Um, it mm. sounds like the right thing, but there is something that it carries that is impure because yeah. it is not the right thing. Yeah. It is not the pure thing, yeah. I guess you could say. Um, so what we see, what we hear, it may sound, um, the words may seem correct. The words may even come from the word of God, but there's just a rhythm about it that does not match the rhythm of heaven, but matches the rhythm of culture. Yeah. It matches the beats of culture and not the beats of heaven. Yeah. Um, you have to have eyes to see and ears to hear to be able to, to discern this sound. Um, this is sound has to be torn down and exposed Amen. in order for the fullness of the sound of heaven um, to be released. Yeah. And, you know, people, I'll just be honest, you know, people will call some me even um, judgmental mm -hmm. or throwing stones mm -hmm. or this and that because it doesn't mm -hmm. sound exactly like this or sound exactly like that. That has nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. you, what I know is what I feel and I hear in the spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wrote what I wrote because I want people's eyes and ears to be open, to be able to discern, to know, you know what? There's just something that's not right about this to the point of where there may be certain songs that you can't sing in your church anymore. That's right. That you've sung right. for years and years and years. That's right. Because you know what? There's just something off about this, Lord. I don't know what it is. And then two years, who knows, two weeks, two years down the road, something comes out and something's exposed. Yeah. Yeah. That had to do with that music or that particular wow. yes. artist or that yeah. thing. And that's what happened to me personally, yeah. the Lord told me to disconnect from a very specific sound several years ago. And I didn't know why, because it was very popular. It was very easy to sing. It sounded amazing. They were very talented. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said to stop. And so I stopped. And then a few years later, things began to came up, come out mm -hmm. here and there. And I said, thank you so much, Lord, for protecting my sound, but protecting the sound of this house. Yeah because we only want to release pure and holy sounds yeah. because what you release is the atmosphere that you create. And that's, that's right. something that you have to be very careful about. That's I'll just right. say from the position of a praise and worship leader, it does matter what songs you sing. That's right. Hmm. It does matter um, what um, sounds even you self, you personally align with in your own time. Um, I do not agree with any praise and worship leader, Christian believer, but I'm talking about praise and worship leaders yeah. right now, listening to any way, shape or form of secular music. Amen. Wow. I highly disagree with that. Yeah. I feel like if you listen to that, then you are polluting your um, channels, channels yeah. and your streams. And yeah. so that means when you go and try to release mm -hmm. the sound of heaven, what you release will be polluted because it's been mixed with the other yeah. Yeah. and the rhythms and the cultures of the world. Yeah. And then what we have are those that think it's okay to listen to one thing and release another. Yeah. And then they try to write something and produce something, and that's called mixture. Yeah, and that's called the counterfeit sound. Does that make right. sense? What yeah. I'm saying? Yes. How I said that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what we're fighting against right now. It is. And you know, there's a song, Missy Edwards. I can hear the rhythm of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. That song is so real to me. Yeah. She wrote that several years ago, mm -hmm. but it is so real to me. But not everybody can hear the rhythm. Of right. the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. Right. And I think the cry of my heart, and one reason I wrote this book, is so that maybe everyone can hear the rhythm of the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. Well, so that they, we can they, release yeah. the pure and holy sound of heaven to usher in the second coming yeah. of the Lord. Because it has to be released in order for him to come. If yeah. they get the book, they're going to get it. That's why we're putting the link in the description. Because this is an impartation of this entire journey that you've been mm -hmm. through. And I'm seeing this synergy between... Uh, worship and prayer and this violent, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Mm -hmm. Pastor Kim, you've yeah. said that we need more violence in the church. What does that yeah. mean, practically speaking? And I, I can't agree yeah. more with that statement, but what do you mean by that when you say it? Well, people have to understand, and I, I, I rattled it off just a few minutes ago, but they have to understand what violence means. Right. Violence is spiritual intensity. Yes. Violence is uh, aggression. We've lost aggression in the church. And early Pentecostals, they had aggression in the mm -hmm. spirit. Now, I understand that there can be things fleshly here and fleshly there. But you know what, guys? We can get in the flesh in any stream or any kind of right. flow or anything that That's we're right. in. We can get in the flesh. I, but I understand that. But the violence that we're talking about is the zeal. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And I know Jessica talks about zeal in in her book and I, you know, uh, marry it, it, you know, against the spirit of religion, but the zeal and the fervency that, 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 that uh, hot boiling fervency, you know, Jesus said, I want me to the, to the, to one of the churches in in, uh, Revelation. I I want you either cold or hot. I can't have you in the middle lukewarm. And so if you're lukewarm, there's no way you're going to have that violence, that spiritual intensity, that aggression. Uh, The, 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 um, um, deception of religion is that you can act the part, but you not have the spiritual authority. Right, right. And, and this is key, Alan. Mm-hmm. The, the deception of religion is that you can act the part, but you not have the spiritual authority. Right. How do I know what right. is one of the telling signs that I'm, I'll just put it in the language that we're using today, in revival and not in religion, you know, mm-hmm. or in spiritual violence and not in, uh, you know, the apathy of religion, but yet I look like I had this. You're going to have a spiritual authority. You're going to carry a spiritual authority. You're going to carry an uncommon anointing. That uncommon anointing that cannot be denied uh, uh, like, like you know, Samson, like those in the New Testament, the apostles, the early apostles. You, you're going to carry uh, that uh, undeniable authority it's going to be something that you don't have to announce, something that you don't have to market. You're going to carry it. It's going to be a mantle on you. And the byproduct of, the byproduct of that is that you're displacing principalities and powers of darkness, that you're moving and you're shifting things in the spirit realm and you're opening the heavens for what reason? So that the king of glory can come in, mm. so that the, uh, the, the, the presence of the Lord can be ushered in. And so the violence that we talk about is that spiritual intensity. And so let's give it kind of a modern day, uh, kind of a kind of a real time uh, a face here. So in a lot of our churches, um, Alan, we have trained people and taught people uh, that they are to come to church instead of to be the church. Hmm. They are to attend church instead of to be the ecclesia. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, we have groomed them to fill the building because as preachers and leaders we want full buildings and we want because that we've been taught that that's success uh, enough people in the building with as many services as we as we you know uh, can host then we're successful but what the byproduct of that is that we have we have laziness we have apathy we have um, we have a low spiritual capacity and I want to emphasize that Alan low, low spiritual, spiritual capacity, capacity small spiritual capacity and then and the result of that is we have no authority uh, very little anointing and we can't move and shift or displace anything and so the violence the spiritual intensity Alan comes from our time with the Lord and our seeking and our pursuing we we've we've pushed pursuit to the side and it's all about a program pursuit Hmm. has been pushed to the side pursuit of jesus pursuit of his presence pursuit of more pursuit of 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 his glory of his realms we've pushed that to the side and it's all become about programs and about protocol and 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 the byproduct is we have very shallow uh, uh believers and and so so the violence is needed to be cultivated on the inside of individual and I, and this is in the pulpit and in the pew and so that spiritual aggression that spiritual intensity that spiritual fervency that spiritual zeal that comes don't miss this from a pure pursuit not a put on right because you can put on zeal right mm-hmm. like a, like a faking the zeal yeah. But no, you know, it's like, like you just mentioned a while ago, it can't be fake. Right. It, you, you know, the, the pure, you're going to be able to tell because that authority is there. And so anyway, that's what we're talking about. We're very passionate about that. Yeah. And there's no better place that it's seen in the area of praise and worship and an in intercession right. for sure. No, that's not and it, does Jessica. Make <laughs> it does. It make does. Religion. Did you want to add to that, Jessica? Because that's, that's seriously one of the marks of your ministry here. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. I mean, zeal is everything. I mean, we did a whole flow on zeal Sunday morning, just yeah, a prophetic, spontaneous flow for about 20 minutes. Yes. Zeal for your house consumes me. Zeal yeah. for your presence consumes me. Zeal, yeah. zeal, zeal, zeal. Zeal is the foundation um, of Judah. It yeah. should be. It mm. should always be to be zealous for him. 
to be um, madly in love with him, yes. um, to be fierce protectors of his presence. Um, that is our responsibility. And when yeah. you have that zeal, when when his presence grips you and he is all that you want, then every time you step into the position that he's called you to step into, mm-hmm. it will always be released from a pure yeah. and holy place. And because yeah. it is released from a pure and holy place, then it will carry that spiritual authority yeah. and that spiritual aggression yeah. that is required to break through yeah. and to break the heavens open yeah. and for people to experience and encounter the presence and the power of God. Yeah. Well, what I don't think you understand, Jessica, is that there are visitors who are coming into your church and they're going to be turned <laughs> off yeah. by this by this <laughs> praise. I don't know how often you get this stick in the oh. mud response to we're trying to win souls you know we're yeah, trying to yeah. it's going to turn people off what's your reaction to that just to make religion mad i guess <laughs> um you know here's what i think if it's pure yep if it's pure mm-hmm. and it's really coming from a pure place yeah i think people will discern that yes. yeah and yes. what will happen is is they will either come into the atmosphere and have a head-on collision with a presence in the glory of God, which is why we start our services the way we start our services, or we'll make religion mad enough to leave. And that's happened before. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah. But that doesn't bother us Mm -hmm. at all, actually. We're not Mm -hmm. trying to make people leave. No, we're not trying to make people leave. It's like I said in in my book, just make religion mad. The religion is a spirit. It's not a person, but it gets on people. Yeah. And so this is very, conf- revival is confrontational. If it's not confrontational, then it's not revival. Absolutely. And so the, the uh, we're, we, you know, here's the thing. We want to, we want to be friendly to the seeker, Alan, but we don't want to be friendly to their sin. Mm. And in order to cut through, right. in order to open the heavens, there has to be that spiritual intensity. And honestly, we have testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony of people who were strung out on drugs, who were addicted to uh, pornography, yep. who were homosexuals, lesbians, yep. uh, uh, you know, uh, the whole uh, heathen lifestyle out there. They give their testimony that they walked into the atmosphere that we have now, and now they're 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 singing on our worship team, or they're 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 ushering, or they're you know uh, leading an intercession, or this you know whatever. We have these testimonies uh, that that just show that people are really looking. People in the world are really looking and hungering for the raw presence of God. Can I testify to you this morning that Gen Z shall be saved? Gen Z shall be set free and Gen Z shall be filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. You're looking, I don't know what you've already seen, but on the screens right here on Wednesday night, the Holy Ghost broke out in one of the most powerful ways I have ever seen. The spirit of conviction, the spirit of freedom, the spirit of salvation were tangible in the room. We had youth and young adults running up to the altar, throwing their cell phones on the altar, throwing faith pins on the altar, throwing weed on the altar, throwing pornography on the altar. And they would hand it to me, and I would have to ask them what it is. And they would tell me, and I would say, do you want me to tell the room? And they said, yes, because someone else needs to bring their idol down to the altar too. And, you know, they party hard for the people and for the for the devil in the world. And so when they come in and see us aggressive for our God and for Jesus, yeah. uh, for Jesus, then this is something that that can resonate and they can identify with. Right. Yeah. So what is, so just to make religion mad again, the link is a description exposing the primary enemy of revival. Who's this book for? Well, I think it's I, well. I think it's for the whole body of Christ. I think it's for for believers. I think it's definitely for for pastors and for leaders. But um, I really, I really would love for this book to get into the hands of those who are so tired. I guess you could say it's a sequel to Doorkeepers of Revival. I don't know how all that works, that but I, mm-hmm. I just felt like this needed to be written, Alan, because you can tell someone a journey. 
but that I wanted to equip them with what we have learned, at least to this point. Yes. Uh, you got to know how to push back on this. Yeah. You got to know how to power through on this. You got to know how to plow. Judah plows. You got to know how to have that come up under that ox anointing and pull revival forward. Once you get a visitation, understand that there will be a confrontation, mm. and that confrontation will be with the spirit of religion. And I wanted to get this into the hands of of, of believers believers into the hands of, of church leaders so that they would understand that, okay, don't back off. That's, that's the bottom line, Alan, is right. don't back off. Once you get a visitation, once you've birthed revival, once your hunger and your desperation has brought you to a place of outpouring like it did for us in 2015, mm -hmm. here's some things you're going to need to know. Don't back off. Don't back off of it and learn to recognize it for what it is right. and learn to, learn to, learn to discern. And in this book, I just want to say, Alan, this book is just as much about revival as it is about religion, the spirit yeah. of religion. And it really is. And I, I you know, there's chapters I was lit, uh, writing in here uh, and, and a couple of them that I rewrote. And one of them was the chapter on the raw cry. And I, I rewrote it from when I, I, I preached it and delivered it the first time a number of years ago. And tears were streaming down my face when I when I wrote the, the, the chapter adapted, the one apprehended by God. Um, tears went a nation shaking revival. I'm literally I'm crying as I as I'm rewriting it for book form here because so it's just as much about revival as it is religion. But I do expose religion in here and I also give the answer, Alan, to how to counter that. And hundredfold cry is one yes. of them. And protecting the pure is another one of them. And a, a chapter that the Lord gave me about um, about the uh, uh, Saul uh, before he became the Apostle Paul and how Jesus said to him, you are persecuting me. And that, Alan, that is the bottom line of the spirit of religion right. is it's persecuting Jesus. Right. And so I did a whole chapter in that in here on, on, on how religion is just persecuting Jesus. If we can get the revelation that this spirit as the, one of the primary enemies of revival is literally persecuting Jesus, then we will will rise up in an in with a zeal yeah. a righteous zeal and a righteous anger right. to combat it and so i want people uh to, to answer your question i want people to have this to, to what we've learned to this point and we're still learning but i want people to know look you don't have to give in to this you don't have to give in you don't have to be and we also have to constantly check our hearts to make sure that our last encounter is not becoming a religious mon a monument mm -hmm. and man that's what we do all the time around here constantly checking our heart in that and if you allow me i want to really re read in my introduction just one thing that Absolutely. I believe really sums and then we're up gonna, a lot. We're going to pray that this gets broken because I think what this book yeah. is going to accomplish is it's going to break weights off of you, chains off of you that you didn't know you had as you read through That's it. Right. That's how powerful this mm -hmm. word is. Go ahead. Yeah, well, Alan, I, I, I think it's important that, that believers and uh, Christian leaders understand uh, this spirit as a primary enemy of revival. And mm -hmm. one of the things I say just in the introduction to the book is that this vile spirit seeks to hinder the flow of the Holy Spirit and to block the receptivity of the seeker. The seeker, the one that's seeking for more of his presence, for more of his glory, for more uh, intimacy with him, in honor with God, um, causing us to settle for a lesser quantity and quality of spiritual encounter. Now, if I can just stop right there and just say, um, that describes a lot of Sunday mornings across the body of Christ. Wow. And I don't mean that in a demeaning way. I don't mean that in a demeaning way. Some people just don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't know that there's more. And and when you're in a pursuit for revival, and then once revival is birthed and you're sustaining it, you got to understand you can't give you can't placate to the spirit. You right. can't you can't you can't mm -hmm. accommodate it. Because, because literally, as I just said, it wants us to settle for a lesser quantity and quality of spiritual encounter. Um, I go on to say that religion has many faces and manifestations, and it does. And I talk about some of them in this book. But when it comes down to it, it is anything that keeps you from entering the fullness of the Lord. So that's it right there. Right. A religion, religious spirit, which is 
is a spirit. It's not a person. So it's not that I want to make a person mad, even though that may happen as a byproduct. It's it's the spirit behind it that does operate through people and it comes uh, tries to settle upon people. That that's why I wrote this book, and that's why Jessica wrote Praise for a Warrior, and uh, we we push on being doorkeepers of revival is because we want people to enter the fullness right. of the Lord. I want to enter the fullness of the Lord. Right. And there's realms of glory. There's mm. realms of His presence. There's realms of the manifestation. God doesn't tap out. We tap out. Wow. And religion tells us to tap out. So this is the next paragraph that I'm going to read to you, which is, which is very short. I really feel like this is, Alan, very, very needed understanding in the body of Christ today. Because a lot of times, and you and I have been around uh, long enough to know that when you talk about religion, you think of old school. You know, you think of traditional, you think of tradition, you think of old school, and that can be religion. But what I felt the Holy Spirit said, tell them that it can be new school as well. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And I say it, religion, it can be old school or new school. It can be extreme legalism or extreme liberalism. Either way, it keeps you from the best that God has. Right. One restricts with extreme boundaries while the other derails you with no boundaries at all. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, both have elements of extremism that keep you from the fullness in God. One is so restrictive that your focus is external Mm -hmm. and the other is so forgiving that your focus is also external. Religion is all about the external, but revival is about the heart. I really Mm -hmm. like to read that and to quote them places that I go when I'm talking about this book, because sometimes we equate religion as to just being old school or traditional, uh, you know, uh, uh, restrictions and all this. And it is, and it can be that, but it can also be new school liberalism with no boundaries at all, because think about it. Both of those are going to keep you from the fullness of God. So religion has many faces, many manifestations, and we really have to identify it. Once we have birthed revival, once we are moving in revival, we have to know what it looks like how to deal with it mm-hmm. and that's what I tried to do in this book talk about revival and religion together so that you will know don't stop when this thing starts rising up when this thing starts pushing against don't stop learn how to push through it and bust through it right wow right. I love that and I love I love the Holy Ghost story hour that we just had there I felt like we were at the public <laughs> library and you were reading us a revival, yeah. a revival <laughs> So that so so just to make religion mad in the praise field, praise field warriors is two sides of the same coin. I don't know if that would be a, a, an accurate description because you're both coming up the yeah. same mountain, but you're coming up from different directions. So, Pastor Jessica, how right. would you describe this book and who it's for? Yeah, if you don't mind, I'm going to take you to story hour as well. <laughs> just read it from the introduction. Um, This book is for Judah. It's to reignite, reposition, and reestablish the mantle, mandate, and holy calling of the praise-filled warrior. And to once again stand in her position, because this is what we're called to do, of living on the front lines. She said it already, going before, making way, and most of all, making sure that the King of Glory has his glory. There are unfortunately many sleeping giants in the church today and Judah has been one of them. But I believe with all of my heart that she's coming alive again. And I also do believe with all of my heart that there are sons and daughters all across this earth who have been crying out for a sound that hasn't been marketed that yeah. hasn't been sold, that hasn't been watered down and mixed with the culture of this world, but yeah. a sound that sets the captive free, Amen. breaks every yoke, heals the brokenhearted, activates the supernatural, birth and sustains revival, mm. shakes the gates Amen. of hell, and breaks open realms of glory. And that is the sound of heaven. Amen. And that is what Judah is meant to hear. Yes. Judah is meant to carry it. Yes. Judah is meant to cultivate it, birth it, and release it. Amen. That is our calling. That is our mandate. That is yeah. why the Lord has given us the sound that he has given us Amen. for such a time as this Amen. to carry that mantle for no other reason except for that. And so I wrote this book to bring us back, Amen. to bring us back, to get into position again. Yes, It really yes. is so powerful and so uniquely your voice. I'd like to read from my book now. Uh, um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we want to listen. We'll listen. Um, you say this, you are not a cheerleader. You are Judah. Yes. You are not a pacifier. Yes. 
You are a provoker. Yeah. You are not a preface yeah. to the main event. You are a host yes. to the glory. And the way that yes. this book walks you into that place is out of this world, yeah. which which I wanted to ask you about this, Pastor Jessica, about floating worship leaders and how you really at- kind of, I don't want to say you attack this, but you address it in the book and how if you want to really have a revival culture, this has to be addressed. Can you talk to us about what I'm referencing here? Yes, that's one of my favorite chapters, actually. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it would be, but as I was writing it out, um, creating a revival culture and being um, established and having a house and a pastor Um, that you're grounded up under. You have to have that authority in your life. And when you have that authority in your life, you have accountability. And I think what we're seeing right now is a lot of nomads um, and a lot of those that are my age and younger um, that are just wandering around without Mm. any kind of accountability in their lives. Um, But what happens is, is when you come up under that biblical authority Mm. that we are called to be up under, is it aligns your sound with the sound of heaven. Um, And so, you know, I've also said before that I am not about uh, musicians or singers for hire. We don't do that here. Um, We've never done it and we never will. We've never been that desperate. Um, Mm. It's not about that around here because I believe that if you're faithful with the pure and if you're faithful with what you have, no matter how big or how small, the Lord is going to honor that and he's going to honor your purity in Mm. that because what happens we start to pull and we get desperate because we want to look like this and we want to sound like that. And Mm. before we know it, our sound has been, um, infiltrated with mixture and perversion and who and and, and, uh, rebellion and who even knows Um, you're just throwing people on your stage left and right and you're up there fighting demons and you think you're fighting an atmosphere but you're fighting your drummer or you're fighting your background singer or you're fighting your and it's absolutely ridiculous and then people are lost and they don't understand that why they can't break into the fullness or why they can't hear the sound of heaven it's because you're not guarding anything it's because you're not treating this as holy ground anymore so going back to even what you said before that is but when you are established underneath that authority and that pastor um, that mentor that you have in your life then that can keep you in alignment and um, I'm really big on that so Well, pray that's why for we, us. Uh, if, uh, or Pastor Kim, do you want to add to that? No, no, no. That's good. Yeah, I, I totally, it's very important. Very important. Well, there's not a culture of hirelings there at your church. There's a, these are people who feel called to be where they are and to be a part of the house that they're in. And that's that's so important. And you've done an amazing job cultivating that. And I know you've got some amazing things that are coming up. You're taking this across the nation. Um, yeah. What are some events? I know this is going to be airing um, three weeks from recording. So what are some events that are that are coming up for you guys in the in the future? Well, it, it, this Friday, which will probably be after, uh, will already have taken place, but we're doing our first Cray America on location in Houston. But we'll be doing two more of those, Alan, uh, this year that we know of. It'll be at least two more. Uh, in in May, we'll be going to uh, Virginia, the southwestern part of Virginia, in the Roanoke-Salem area. So we'd love for all the region to come out and join us there. And then in August, August will be in Los Angeles, yeah. in the city of Los Angeles, or in the Los Angeles area. Uh, that will be announced where you know exactly where the venue will be and everything uh, here here uh, shortly. But we invite everybody in these regions to come. And so anyway, the 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 burden for that is to take the sound that God has placed within us in the in the cultivated within us in intercession and in worship and release it into regions. And it really will be a prayer meeting. Yeah. Uh, I promise that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not a conference thing where we have, you know, this, this, and this, but we have we have uh, very much a heart to come in and, and link arms with uh, Christians, believers, hungry uh, people, the pastors, uh, leaders, ministry leaders in these regions to open the heavens, to contend with them, mm-hmm. to agree with them so that revival, so that we can have a nation shaking history making revival like Azusa Street, like a Brownsville again. It's time for one. Mm. It's time for one. I think the face of it's going to look a little different now than it did in those eras, but but it's time for one. And I believe this may not be the only thing, but I believe here's the thing. 
prayer is the way. And we have a lot of things that we're doing in the body of Christ right now. Um, prayer is kind of on this bot bottom part of the list there. And I don't mean that in a demeaning way or whatever, but I mean gathering the body, gathering the church to pray. And we also want these times to be a time of impartation of revival anointing mm -hmm. and revival cry and the glory coming in. And so we're just we're bringing our whole team yeah. uh, uh, and, and, of course, myself, my husband, our, our pastoral team, and uh, many of our people here mm -hmm. at Fresh Start are, are are treating this like a missions trip yep. and they're coming to Houston to the other areas uh, literally to just partner with people in those yeah. regions to see revival break out and then of course Alan every first weekend of the month here at Fresh Start we have our doorkeepers of revival weekend and I just say drop in anytime Get because there. we're contending for fullness of the presence yeah. uh, every time we come together. Yeah. yeah, You'll never fully understand it until you get in the building and see what it's like. And first of all, got to give a shout out to Pastor Paul, your, your amazing husband, because it's so, it's so unique to see, uh, in today's world, to see a move of God that is demonstrative and then to have a strong scriptural and doctrinal foundation with a man of God like that who preaches and teaches the word. And of course you yes, as well, yeah. but but he's not here, so I thought I'd yeah. bring him up because he's he's just yeah. he's, Thank you. he's yeah. amazing. Thank he's you. amazing. And what he's been yes. preaching is amazing. And I want you yes. to pray for us. Either one or however you're okay. led, that the spirit of religion or the things that are on us that we don't even know is holding us back will be broken off of us, that we would step into this while it's fresh and while it's hot. Amen. Hey Amen. I think we'll both pray just real briefly. Um, I'll, I'll start yeah. and then just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to be with Alan, to be with his audience today, God. And I just pray. Father, over them right now, a fresh, raw cry for your presence, a fresh, yes. raw cry for your presence, yes. for the manifestation of your glory mm -hmm. and the fullness of your realms of glory. I pray, Father, that wherever they're sitting right now or standing or wherever they're at, I pray that there be welling up within them, oh God, a cry for more yes. of you and that the resonation of that cry would go greater and greater and greater and greater, Lord God, mm -hmm. and that it would spill over, Lord, if a pastor is watching, it would spill over to his congregation. Yes to her congregation, yes. if a worship leader is watching, that it would yes. spill over into their worship team and into their congregation. Yes. If a prayer leader is watching, that it would spill over yes. into their intercessory ministry, yes. into their prayer ministry. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would equip them right now, oh God, with an impartation of hunger, an impartation yes. of yes. desperation, oh God. Yes. And that is how we're going to make the spirit of religion mad. Mm. That is how we're going to make the spirit of religion uncomfortable in our personal lives and in our corporate atmospheres. And Lord, I pray if they catch anything today, help them to catch a hunger and a desperation yes. for more of you. I pray for yes. breaker voices to yes. be born yes. and to be birthed. Lord yes. God, in regions and in at, in, 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 in region and zones of this nation so that we can see a nation shaking, history making revival so that we can tell stories uh, Lord of miracles and signs and wonders yes. of how God broke in in our generation. I pray for that impartation of revival hunger, Lord God, that would come against a religious spirit right now in the name yes. of Jesus. Let it be so. Yes, God, and Father, right now. Jesus, we ask you, Lord, that you would grip the heart of Judah again, yes. oh Lord. I pray, Father, as your word has been released and as truth has been released, Father, in the name of Jesus, that there will be a burning that rises up in the midst of yes. Judah to step into her original position, her yes. original intention, yes. her original calling in the name of Jesus. And I decree and I declare, Father, that as those are watching and, and hearing that you would stir a hunger on the inside of them so yes. much so father yes. that they would break open Amen. the sound of heaven to Amen. be released into their regions into their cities into their churches father in the yes. name of jesus i yes. decree and i declare in this hour that you are giving judah eyes to see yes. and ears to hear yes. a tangible connection yes. with the sound of heaven Amen. with the power and the purpose of the spirit yes. of praise i thank you father so in the name of jesus that judah will begin so to crave 
your presence like they've never craved it before, that they'll begin to crave your word like they've never craved it before, Father. Oh, that they would begin to to crave your your precepts, Father. Lord, in the name of Jesus, that it would not look to the right and to the left, God, but they they would search you out. They would search you out to know what they're called to do and called to release for such a time as this. And I decree and I declare, Lord, that you are raising up a generation of breakers, Father, to break through and tear down anything that would try to hinder the fullness of your glory from being released in every every region, every city, every state, every church. In the name of Jesus, you are mantling voices right now to break through and break open for the sake of your glory, for the sake of revival. In Jesus' name, let it be. Amen. Yes, let it be. In Jesus' name. Somebody lift your hands and shout hallelujah. I receive that in Jesus' name. Pastors Kim and Jessica, we can't thank you enough for being on the program. The praise-filled warrior establishing the mantle of Judah and just to make religion mad, exposing a primary enemy of revival. They're both in the links linked up in the description of this video. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you, Alan. We appreciate us. you. Appreciate your voice. Thank yes. you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. And thank you all for listening, for watching. Make sure you share this message and get it in front of as many people as you can. Buy these books for the leadership in your church and in your ministry. Put it in their hands so that this revelation can spread across the nation and around the world. And we'll see you next time. I'm so excited to announce our brand new special offer. Listen, everything we do here on Encounter Day would not be possible if it weren't for your support. We are standing for truth. The attacks are intense. The persecution is real, but we are reaching the world with the gospel. The missions work that we do, the outreaches that we do, it's all possible because of your support. But we always want to feed your faith, and we always want to give you something to build your library or that you can then give out and be a blessing to others. And this week, we have a special battle bundle, is what we're calling it, where we're going to be giving you three things. You're going to get my brand new book, Armed for Victory. You're also going to be getting the Ephesian Mandate, which is an intense study of the armor of God. And when you get the Ephesian mandate, what comes with that is access to one of our best e-courses, hours and hours of teaching that's going to take you deep into the armor of God and transform your life. This is an amazing compilation between the two when it comes to getting victory and spiritual warfare, and it's all available for a gift of any size. All you have to do is go to EncounterToday.com, check out the special offer, and pray about what the Holy Ghost would have you do. Go to EncounterToday.com and get your seat in the ground.